once again, good afternoon to you all. I thank you for being here. August 28, August 28, has become an important date in modern American history. August 28, I'm gonna ask you to do some mental math. Some mental math. If you have notebook and paper, you can scribble this down. Some, a bit of math. August 28, 52 years ago, 52 years ago, what year was it? Someone raised their hand, be recognized, and then let us know. What year was it? 52 years ago. 52 years ago. Yes, sir. 1963. Very good. It was 1963. On August 28, 1963, in Washington, D.C., a gathering of over 200,000 people met on the mall in Washington, D.C. at an event known as the March on Washington, full name being March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It was at that event America heard, most of America heard, a speech delivered by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Most of us have heard it, Perry Pumas, called I Have a Dream. Um, Sidelight. It wasn't the first time he'd done that speech. Dr. King's, um, his group, SCLC and those who traveled with him had heard I Have a Dream several times. It wasn't the first time he delivered that speech. It was the largest live audience to, whom he de to which he delivered, but it wasn't the first time he delivered that speech, March on Washington. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about August 28th, eight years previous to that. On August 28 of 1955, August 28, 1955, 6-0, 60 years ago today, a 14-year-old young person by the name of Emmett Till, black kid, 14 years old from Chicago, while visiting relatives in Mississippi, was murdered. That's what we're here to talk about today. When I teach this subject, and I teach this subject to young people and adults, when I teach this, I share that the Emmett Till killing was the spark, the spark that ignited the Civil Rights Movement fire. This Emmett Till killing occurred a couple of months before Mrs. Parks didn't give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery. It happened before all of America heard about that well-spoken young Reverend Doctor, Dr. Dr. King. This Emmett Till murder preceded all of that. And oh, by the way, in Mississippi, in August of, of 1955, Emmett's murder was the third, Emmett's murder was the third that month of black man by white people for which no justice occurred. We're gonna talk about the Emmett Till saga today. Some other mental math I need some help with. In 1896, 1896, the Supreme Court rendered a decision in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which said, separate but equal public facilities are okay. It's okay to have separate facilities based on race, so long as those facilities are equal. What does that mean? That means it was okay to have segregation. Segregation was legal. Segregation was the law of the land. If you wanted to have segregation, it was okay to do. And for quite a while, states lived by that. That was all people knew. Now, in 1954, 
the Supreme Court rendered another decision in the Brown versus Board of Education case that said segregation, the separate but equal, in public schools is unconstitutional. So now here's the help I need with the math. How many years is it between 1896 and 1954? Yes, sir. 58 years, you're exactly right, 58 years. So for 58 years, 58, segregation was legal. It was okay to have segregated schools if a municipality wanted to have segregated schools. It was okay to do, it was legal. It was legal. Help me with this also. Now, um, our country, our great country, I'd rather live no place else than these United States. I think it's the best place on earth to live. Yay, United States. I'm all with that. We have 50 states. Which was the 50th? Which was the 50th? Yes, sir. No, that was 49th. Yes, sir, Captain America. Hawaii was the 50th state. Now, here's a question I'm not sure if anybody's gonna be able to answer. One person did answer it earlier today. In what year did Hawaii become a state? In what year did Hawaii become a state? Yes, sir, here in the front. Say that again, please. 1969, no. Let's take one more. Yes, in the back. 1959, very good. 1959, Hawaii became the 50th state. So here's another math question. For how long has the United States had 50 states? For how long have we had 50 states? Yes, sir, we haven't heard from you. Huh? You're close, you're close. Yes, sir. We've had 50 states for 56 years. Okay, Mr. Perthrow, what's all this math stuff about? What I want you to realize is, for most of the people in this room, all we've known of these United States is 50 states. That's all we've known. That's all we've known. We've been like that for 56 years, 50 states. Long time. Segregation was legal longer than we've had 50 states. Segregation was legal for 58 years. You all just told me that. From 1896 to 1954, segregation was legal. That was the rule of law. Last little math question. Since our talk today will center around the state of Mississippi, Mississippi achieved its statehood in 1817. But it wasn't until 1967 that in the state of Mississippi, a white man was found guilty of murder of a black man. 1817 to 1967, how many years is that? Yes, sir. 150 years, 150 years, 150, oh, 150 years in Mississippi before a white man was found guilty of killing a black man. That's our backdrop, that's our backdrop. Emmett Till, 14 year old young person, how many are 14 in here today? 14 years old, all right. You and Emmett Till have that in common. Emmett Till, 14 years old, African-American young man from Chicago, where he attended schools that were not segregated. He attended a school similar to Perry. Children of all races attend. That was Emmett's reality. He wasn't, uh, what is this, segregation, white here, colored, that wasn't Emmett's reality at home. He was used to integration in everything. That's what he was used to. After school ended, his school term for 54-55, when it ended, he told his mother he wanted to accompany some cousins of his on a train trip down to Mississippi. 
to go visit other relatives. Well, next slide, please. On the, before he left, Emmett's mother gave him the old motherly warning, you know, be good and all that stuff. But uh, there's a word on the screen spelled M-O-R-E-S. It looks like Moors, but the word isn't Moors. It's a two-syllable word. The word is mores. The word is mores. A more is simply a way of doing something. In your house, you have mores. You have ways of doing things. Some of us have, uh, like in our classroom, we have this moray or a couple of mores in our classroom. One is we practice chivalry. In our classroom, it's always ladies first. Another moray in our classroom is I address the students not by their first names. They are all miss or mister to me. Another moray in C205 is that we have smooth jazz playing as the students enter. This doesn't mean it's right or wrong, it's just a way of doing things. How many of us at home right now, how many of us at home when we're eating dinner, Sometimes we don't eat with knife and fork, but what we'll do is that we'll have tortillas, we'll tear the tortilla, pick up food with the tortilla, and then eat like that. How many of us do that at home? That is a moray. That is a way of doing something. That's a moray. Emmett's mother, before he left going to Mississippi, told Emmett that Mississippi had some different mores than he was used to in Chicago. She said, Emmett, while you're there, Emmett, do not speak to a white person. Question? Do not speak to a white person unless they speak to you first. Secondly, Emmett, don't you stare at, don't you touch a white woman. Now for us, living outside of Phoenix in 2015, that might sound kind of weird, strange, or crazy. But in Mississippi, in the mid-1950s, it was as real as this stage. If you violated those mores, you could lose your life. And it's like, oh, okay, my, yeah, I got it, I got it, okay, yeah, I, nah, okay, let me go. I got it. So Emmett travels down to Mississippi with a couple of other Chicago cousins to their great uncle's house, who's a sharecropper living in a, a, a farm-styled house out in Sumner, Mississippi. Emmett's down there ready to fellowship with the cousins and, you know, hang out and just see his people. He didn't know he was going to have to go down to Mississippi in the hot humidity and pick cotton. During the day, it wasn't about playing baseball or football or basketball or swimming. It was about going in the fields and picking cotton. That's just what they did. Well, on Emmett's fourth day of being there, he and the boys are like, okay, it's the weekend, let's go <clears throat> to town. Good. Next slide, please. They get in the car and leave Grand Sumner, Mississippi, and go to the little podunk little spot called Money, Mississippi. You can see on the screen, Money's this big place, a population of about 400 people. That was it in the entire town. Money had a store, a store called Bryant's Grocery Store. And Emmett and his friends, Emmett, his cousins and friends, were hanging out in front of Bryant's, you know, just talking and laughing and having fun. Now, ladies, ladies, how many of you are aware of this? When you see a group of guys just kind of hanging out and talking, ha, 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 laughing, yeah, dude, <laughs> doing all that. <laughs> ladies, how many are aware of that? A lot of what is being said in that little group isn't always the truth. Ladies, how many of us know that? <laughs> Sorry, fellas, sorry, fellas, sorry, sorry, fellas. Sorry, fellas. Okay, gentlemen, now to you. Gentlemen, 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 gentlemen. 
How many of you have been in those groups, you know, with your boys, just talking, you know, doing what you do, and you hear somebody tell a story, and they kind of exaggerate the story, make it sound bigger and bigger and better than it really is? Who's been there before? Okay, see, I'm not making this up. <laughs> I'm not making it up. All right, so that's what's happening. That's what's happening in front of Bryant's grocery store. That's what's happening. Emmett and about 10 or 12 other guys just talking, hanging out, laughing. And then Emmett drops the bomb on them. Emmett pulls out his wallet and shows these Mississippi kids, these Mississippi guys, some pictures of some people with whom he goes to school. And some of the people in the pictures were white. Now this is mind-blowing for the Mississippi guys because remember, all they know is segregation. That's all they know. They've never been to school with a white person before. Ne that's never happened. They grow up knowing in Mississippi during this time. They don't speak to a white person until they've been spoken to first. And as far as the black boys and white girls, oh no, mm-mm, mm-mm. We can't even look too hard at a white woman. Trouble will come our way. Emmett then goes on to say, ooh, yeah. See that picture? Of that girl right there? Uh-huh, that white girl? <laughs> she was my girlfriend. Oh, my God! Oh, goodness gracious! I don't believe it! <laughs> the Mississippi guys went crazy because that was unfathomable for them. For them to have a white girlfriend in that aura, that arena of strict segregation with those mores in Mississippi at the time, they couldn't believe it. The oldest one in the group said, oh, okay, okay, mm-hmm. They called Emmett Bobo. All right, Bo, all right. You all big and bad, uh-huh. There's a white girl in that store right there. I bet you won't go talk to her. Now, the lady in the store is the wife of the store owner, and she was a local beauty pageant winner. Her name was Carolyn Bryant. So Emmett goes into the store. There are two other people in the store at this time, two other people. They transact their business, so now it's just Emmett and Mrs. Bryant in the store. What truly happened when it was just Emmett and Mrs. Bryant, the world will now never know. Emmett was killed. Mrs. Bryant had divorced Mr. Bryant, married somebody else, and she died a few years ago. So nobody's ever now going to know what truly, truly happened. But this was Mrs. Bryant's account of what happened. Mrs. Bryant said, Emmett went to buy some candy. She paid, she, he brought the candy and the money. She paid him. She said when she went to give him his change, he grabbed her hand. And she tried to pull it away, he grabbed tight and said, oh, don't worry. I know how to treat a white woman. Then she finally jerked away from him. According to Mrs. Bryant, Emmett then went behind the counter put his hands on her hips and said, no, don't try to break away. I know how to treat the white women. I know how to do that. Eventually, she wrestles away again and runs toward the back of the store. By then, one of Emmett's cousins comes into the store. He claims he never saw Emmett touch Mrs. Bryant. He never heard Emmett say anything appropriate to Mrs. Bryant. So he hurries Emmett out of the store. While the boys are back out in front of the store talking about what happened in the store. Now wait a minute, I'm not a good whistler. Can anybody do a wolf's whistle, one of those Oh good, do it again, do it again. Okay good, I'm gonna, when I need that, I'm gonna point right at you in the front, you. Do it again. Okay good. All right, Mrs. Bryant, comes rushing out of the store, headed toward her truck. And as the story goes, 
when she leaves the store and heads toward her truck, Emmett does a wolf's whistle at her. Now, whatever happened, whether he talked to her inappropriately, whether he grabbed her hand, whether he grabbed her hips, or whether he did a wolf's whistle, whichever one of those he did, he violated Mississippi mores. And as we said earlier, violating those mores can cost you your life. Emmett hurries back to his great uncle's house where he's staying, and he swears everybody to secrecy. Don't tell anybody what happened. Don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. Mrs. Bryant's husband was out of town at the time. When he returns back to the great town of money, word had spread that some black boy from Chicago had done something inappropriate to his wife. Any self-respecting Mississippi white man in the mid-1950s would not stand for some black boy disrespecting his wife. So, Mr. Roy Bryant gets on the phone, calls his half-brother, a guy named J.W., J.W. Milam. Now, J.W. was pretty well known in this money area. J.W. was about 6'4", weighed 235 pounds, a decorated World War II veteran. He would won awards for bravery and for his use of weapons. J.W. Milam. They decide, do Bryant and Milam, they're going to teach this black boy from Chicago a lesson. So that night, they drive out to Emmett's great uncle's house, this farmhouse out in Sumner, about two in the morning, totally dark, totally black. Pound on the door. Mr. Mose Wright, Emmett's great uncle, comes to the door. Who is it? It's Mr. Bryant, says Roy Bryant. Mr. Wright opens the door. Mr. Wright says all he sees are two white men, a flashlight, and a pistol. And one of the men says, you got a boy here from Chicago. Yeah, I, I have. Where is he? The two white men barge into the house and start looking through the house for the boy from Chicago. They go into one room, nothing. They go into another room. They see a room, and they go into one room where there are four people, two beds, two people in each bed. Who's the boy from Chicago? Well, two of them in that room were from Chicago. So they just snatch one of them, which happens to be Emmett, take him outside to their truck and say to a person in their truck, is this the boy? The person in the truck says, yes, that's the boy. They put Emmett in the back of the truck and drive away. That third person is presumed to have been Mrs. Bryant. That's who it is presumed to have been. There's never been any proof about that. Mrs. Bryant was actually, there was, they were trying to bring her up on trial since you all have been born. In the early 2000s, they were trying to reinvestigate her role in this. But it went by the wayside because there wasn't enough evidence to actually have a trial. Bryant and Milam had the idea of taking Emmett to a cliff about an hour away from where they had picked him up. They were going to threaten to push him off this 100-foot cliff just to teach him a lesson about how to treat white women in Mississippi. They couldn't find the cliff, so they kept on driving and ended up at a barn on the property of one of JW's associates. Inside the barn, they began to beat Emmett. Two grown men began to and beat him, and beat him. And J.W. Milam finally took out a pistol, pow, shot Emmett right through the eye. Emmett ends up being killed. Now we have to dispose of the body. What the two gentlemen had done, they found a 75-pound fan from a cotton gin, affixed it to Emmett's neck with a wire, took him to the Tallahatchie River, 
threw his body in the river with the thought, of course, being the fan will weigh the body down, the body will be at the bottom of the river. Wipe their hands clean of it, Brian and Milam go back home. Mose Wright, though, reported his great nephew as a missing person. He had no idea where Emmett was. Four days later, while fishing in the Tallahatchie River, a 17-year-old young person who happened to have been white sees what he thinks are human knees and feet. He walks over and sees this naked human body with this big round fan affixed to the neck that had washed up to shore. He calls his father, who calls the sheriff, who then calls the coroner. The coroner calls Emmett's uncle. Remember, Emmett's uncle had reported the body missing. Emmett's uncle comes, along with the sheriff and the coroner, to the site where the body was found. The sheriff said, there's no way that that's Emmett. There's no way. That body is too badly disfigured and distorted. That looks like it's been in the river for about 10 to 15 days. You reported Emmett missing only four days ago. There's no way that that's Emmett. The great uncle said, yeah, it is Emmett. How do you know? I it is Emmett. Emmett would always wear a ring, a ring with his father's initials on it, L.T., a ring given to him by his father. The dead body, the dead nude body that had been so badly disfigured was wearing the ring. That was Emmett Till's body. Bryant and Milam are then arrested. The trial lasts one week, five days of testimony. The jury then deliberated. Oh, let me tell you about the jury. The jury in the Tallahatchie County Courthouse was all white men. Okay, what's the big deal about that? Big deal about that is, it's strange because the majority of citizens that lived in Tallahatchie County were African American. So why was the jury all white? Perry Pumas, this is an example of what's known as institutionalized racism. Institutionalized racism. What that means is the system is racist. The system is. Let me explain to you how that worked. In order to become a juror in Tallahatchie County, you would have to have been a registered voter. Okay? 15th Amendment to the Constitution says, all men have the right to vote, 19th Amendment, all women have the right to vote. So everybody's able to vote. But in certain places in the South, only African Americans, only African Americans had to either take a literacy test and or pay a poll tax in order to register to vote. A lot of the African Americans weren't allowed to go to school where they needed to go to school, how long they needed to go to school, couldn't pass a literacy test, and many were too poor to pay the poll tax, which meant a lot of African Americans weren't registered to vote, which also meant if you follow the steps, there weren't many African Americans qualified to be jurors. Emmett Till's jury, after five days of testimony, sat in the deliberation room for exactly one hour and seven minutes. After five days of testimony, 67 minutes. One of the jurors said we would have been finished faster, but we stopped to get some pop and eat hot dogs and rendered a verdict of not guilty. Everybody knew Bryant and Milam had done this, this murder, but the jury found them to be not guilty. America is now shocked. America couldn't believe America could not believe that this horrificness could happen to a 14-year-old young person at the hands of two adults. And it was known who the two adults were. 
and the jury found them not guilty. That's Emmett on the top left. That's also Emmett in the other two images. This is what happened to Emmett Till. These are the photos that shocked America. Shocked America. I want you to look closely on this one here, the one right above my head. Mrs. Till, Emmett's mother, says that in addition to shooting him through the eye and beating him, beating him savagely, that the perpetrators also took an ax and chopped right here on his, his skin, right here, so that his face would flop off away from the rest of his skull. You can see maybe some evidence of that if you look very carefully here on the, t on the right side of this picture. You see like some, some twine or some thread or something, some stitching. That's what Mrs. Till was talking about. A few weeks after the verdict, not guilty, a few weeks after, Bryant and Milam told their story to a magazine, Look Magazine. You can find it online. Just go to Google Look, L-O-O-K, Look Magazine. Told their story for $4,000. They admitted they killed Emmett Till. They talked about why they killed Emmett Till. They talked about how they killed Emmett Till. J.W. Milam said, look, when he was talking about he had had a white girl, oh no, that was it. <laughs> I decided right then he wasn't going to see the sunshine anymore. That wasn't going to happen anymore. He was not going to see the sunshine anymore. About this school desegregation stuff, J.W. went on to say, oh, okay. Maybe I can, do, I can deal with that. But these black boys and white, oh, oh no, mm -mm. we're not having that. Not here in the South, we are not having it. Not having it. But this ends up having international repercussions and ramifications. Um, help me, Perry Pumas, help me. Who was the United States' number one enemy in 1955? Yes, sir. The Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union was our number one enemy. As the United States tried to um, spread democracy and capitalism, the Soviet Union was trying to spread communism. The Soviets used this Emmett Till case for, as propaganda, saying America is hypocritical. How can America preach that all citizens are created equal and everybody has freedom? when in their own country, a young man who happens to be black is brutalized and killed by two white men, and those two white men are not guilty. How could America keep saying it's the land of the free, home of the brave, if it's allowing that to happen? This negative press spread by the Soviets began to hurt the Eisenhower administration. President Eisenhower wanted a quick end to this Emmett Till saga. Meanwhile, and you, I sent these documents to your teachers. Meanwhile, the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, composed letters and sent them to special assistants of President Eisenhower saying that Emmett Till's mother was being used by and was working for the Communist Party of America to spread the word of communism, to downplay the, the, the greatness of the United States. These are in letters composed by FBI head J. Edgar Hoover. Were these letters, was proof of this ever verified? No. That Mrs. Till was in cahoots with the Communist Party. I want to bring this now closer to you. Have any of you, just by show of hands, ever heard the name of a young person, teenager, named Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin, Florida, teenager, killed, broad daylight, by a white man, body laying on the sidewalk. Because of a Florida law, the person responsible for Trayvon Martin's death, who was unarmed, the person who was responsible for Trayvon's death, 
not guilty. Just like Emmett Till. I know all of us have heard about Ferguson, Missouri. Who's heard the name Michael Brown before? African-American teenager. Shot dead, shot in the back, dead. Body laying in the street for three hours, broad daylight. Litigation for that case is ongoing right now. Young people, now we ask all of you, I even ask myself, so it's we, it's a we thing. What can we do? What can we do on this, the 60th anniversary of the Emmett Till murder? What can we do to help this great country become even better? And I thank you for being a great audience. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Questions, questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, in one of the pictures, he looked like he was pleased. In one of the pictures, what, ma'am? When he died, in the other picture. Mm -hmm. Can we bring up the pictures again, please? Okay, maybe he looks older in the pictures. Remember, that body had been in the river for four days. Um, it was, when the body was sent, nobody, none of the other classes heard this part. In the, in the packing of the body, when it was sent from Mississippi to Chicago, there was a special kind of chemical that helped the body to decompose even faster. The question up here was about the, how old Emmett looks in these photos. He looks older than 14. Well, his body was decomposing more rapidly. And they had trouble even trying, even opening the trunk in which the body was shipped. And Mrs. Till said, because um, it was an open casket funeral, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And here we are 60 years later, and this picture was still, they still, ah, not really pleasant to look at. Imagine being at the funeral walking by and seeing it, seeing Emmett's distorted figures. Other questions? Thank you very much. Other questions? Other questions? Oh, go ahead, young person. Um, did anyone try to reopen the case? On to reopen the case of Bryant and Milam? Well, help me with this, if there are any juniors and seniors in here especially. Um, can Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam have been tried again for this case? No. no. Tell me the reason why. <coughs> yes, sir. Nah, you're on the right track. Not because of judicial review, but you're on the right track. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes. Because of what's called double jeopardy. You can't be retried for the same case if a, if a jury's verdict is not guilty. So it's like, yeah, we did it. We did it! but we've been found not guilty. We won't go to jail for it. Other questions? Other questions? <coughs> Other questions? Well, once again, thank you very much. Teachers, your students are now in your hands. Thank you again.